speak from a text which many people acknowledge is one of the most misinterpreted texts in the entire Bible. And somebody said, when you take a text out of, a te out of context, you use it as a pretext. Jeremiah 29 is that famous chapter that is so often preached about. And, and it, in order to understand Jeremiah 29, you need to read Jeremiah 28. Whenever we read the Bible, we've got to read it from God's perspective. We don't just nitpick something that is convenient to our situation and try to use it as a, as a focus to allowing God to do what He wants to do in our lives in His way, not ours. So I'm going to look at Jeremiah 28. And it came to pass, verse 1, in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year, in the fifth month, that Hananiah, spoke unto me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and all the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord. Wow. That's very prophetic. I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years, will I bring again into this place all the vessels of the house of the Lord, that Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon took away from this place and carried them to Babylon, and I will bring again to this place Jeconiah, the son of so and so, with all the captives of Judah. Wow. You see, the people of Israel, Jeremiah was written in the context of a captivity. And whenever you read Jeremiah, you need to understand the context in which God is speaking to his people. And I have people, you know, some of you sitting here, some of you outside, who have this philosophy. Don't worry, everything is going to be alright. That's furthest from biblical truth. So the false prophet was telling the people that in two years, God will bring them the deliverance they so desperately sought after. In other words, God was going to work quickly. We live in a day and age where we have microwave Christianity. But my Bible teaches me that God works more in the context of a conventional oven rather than a microwave. And one person said, let me have responsibility for it. You know how to sift the wood from the trees. And I'm sure you've met people who, when you're facing a challenge and a struggle, say, don't worry, be happy, it's going to work out. I wish it was so simple thing. But these people are like hand and eye. They have no understanding of how God works in the fullness of time because they don't read their Bible in the way they should. So God is speaking supposedly and telling his people things are going to work out two years, you're going to go back. Now they were in Babylon because of their disobedience. That's not a popular message today, but it's a biblical one. Every time you and I make a bad choice in life, there is a corresponding consequence. Grace and truth are always enmeshed together. John chapter 1 verse 17. Grace without truth is compromise. And a lot of Christians believe they can live the life they want and God will somehow mitigate the consequence because of grace. That's not good to them. 
I wish it was. The great apostle Paul says in Romans, you know, the things that I do not want to do, I do, O wretched man that I am. Every bad choice has a parallel bad consequence. And the only time we receive the grace of God is when we turn from that consequence and choose obedience as the pathway for life. I'm reminded in the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel, God tells Saul, obedience is better than sacrifice. In other words, when you and I, and I'm including myself in this, walk in disobedience, even our act of worship is displeasing to God. There's a finality in that statement. God told Samuel, Saul, you know, if you were not disobedient, your kingdom would never have departed from you. David was never God's first choice. He was God's alternative to Saul's disobedience. Truth bears inspection. And so in order to counter the false teaching and false prophecy of one man, God raises up a faithful prophet. In the midst of all the lukewarmness, the indifference, the compromise of the church of Jesus Christ, God still has a remnant who is faithful and committed to him. And sometimes we might feel isolated and alone, a lone voice like John the Baptist. But yet, it is a voice that God puts his anointing and favor on. And so we come to Jeremiah 29. Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the residue of the elders which were carried away captive to the priests, to the prophets, to all the people who Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive. Wow. That said, the Lord of hosts, verse 4. Build houses, verse 5. Dwell in them, plant gardens and eat the food. Take wives, beget sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons, give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away. And pray unto the Lord for it. For in the peace thereof you shall have peace. For thus saith the Lord. Let not your prophets and diviners that are in the midst of you. Deceive you neither hearken to your dreams which you have dreamed. For they prophesy falsely unto you. I have not sent them. That's not a popular message, but it's a biblical one. I watch Christian television from time to time, and I am amazed at what I listen to. And I turn it off, because it more often than not it seems to be, gimme, 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 my name is Jimmy. I remember one guy, famous, I won't mention the name. And he says, it's a large church. And he says, when you put that hundred dollars into this account, right now, God is getting ready to send you a check in your mailbox. Wow. If I really believe that, I will put a thousand, then I get ten thousand. That is Western Christianity. Sorry. God is not in it for a quick fix as some of us believe. Disobedience has a painful consequence. That is why although everything in me has a 
tendency to sin, I stay committed to God by His grace because I realize that every time in the Bible a man made a mistake, almost always his children repeated the mistake. That's frightening. That's frightening. John Maxwell. He said every time he faces temptation. How many of you guys face temptation? Oh, guys, guys. Guys who have this problem more than the, the ladies. Ladies have other temptations. They are more common in nature. Clothing, all that stuff. How many of you guys have temptation? Look at that. Some of you half a temptation. I have half a temptation. Every time we are faced with temptation. Somebody asks me, Pastor, you're 73. Does it get easier? I said, on the contrary, it gets worse. <laughs> I am reminded of one truth that when David sinned, when Solomon sinned, the consequence wasn't worth the temporal pleasure. And I say, God, get me out of here. Somebody asked me, in Pakistan do you get temperature? Guess what? Hijab and all. At least you remember that. Okay. So Jeremiah is raised up by God to speak into a context that was painful and challenging. They were in Babylon because of a consequence. But even in that context, God speaks about our grace to me. Because God's purpose for our lives is always redemptive. Number one, five things you can learn from this. God doesn't always work in a straight line in the way we want him to. We sometimes believe that our prayers are directed to God in the belief he will work in a straight line. But he doesn't. The false prophet said two years, but through Jeremiah, God says 70. That's a long time. In other words, many of these captive believers wouldn't see the fulfillment of the promise in their day, their age, their generation. When we exposit scripture, we must exposit it in the original authentic way that God wants it exposited, not spiritual. David was in a cave, you are in a cave. So that's said the Lord. Be careful whose voice you give yourself to. When people come and tell you and whisper in your ear, it's going to be all right, don't believe them. Learn to get a word direct from God. I am very careful what I tell people. Because I don't want to stand in for God as some people do. There's a danger when we stand in for God and try to interpret God's will for somebody else's life 
that we can set them on a path of destruction rather than good. You see, the problem in the charismatic church is we've got all these scriptures in our hip pocket and just pass them out like, you know, like candles in the front there. It's not so simplistic. I find it, it difficult to interpret God's will for my life. Leave alone somebody else. And I'm reminded of Pastor Colton who, you know, was a great man of God. When people come to him for some direction and a word, you know, word, empty hands and empty heads, he said, when did you buy them? Because the Bible that you have or should have is the best revelation of God's will for your life if you are willing to read. The more Jeremiah sought God, the more clarity he received on the tone and direction that God said for his life. I wish there was an easy way. You know, some people have promise boxes. In Sri Lanka, they should send those little promise boxes to make money out of it. That's the only reason. And they put all the good stuff in the promise box. But every promise is conditional upon our willingness to follow the instruction. We like, some people tell me, you know, pastor so and so, preacher so and so, they are inspirational. That's great. But Jeremiah was called to be instruction. That's the difference. The distinction between true prophets of God and false ones are they those who are willing to be faithful to the word that God gives them to speak to the people. You know, some of us, when we don't like the medication the doctor gives, we change the doctor. In the hope, we would have a better outcome. Jeremiah was faithful to the task and the assignment that God had given him. For thus saith the Lord, verse 10, after 70 years I accomplished in Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you in causing you to return to this place. God's timing is perfect. Ours isn't. Timing is everything. John chapter 2 verse 4, Jesus said, my time has not yet come. God's timing and ours are diametrically opposed to each other. When we think of timing, we think of a clock, we think of a calendar, God works outside of that. And you and I, through prayer, cannot force God or coerce Him to work outside His time. John 7 verse 6, the right time for me has not yet come. John 7 38, 20, his time has not yet come. God has a time, Ecclesiastes 3 tells me, for everything under heaven. Time to live, time to die. You know, we are trying to find some way in this universe of slowing down the process of death. But God has a time. We can prolong it by healthy eating. <laughs> but we all go to die, right? Some of us sooner than you. My fear is not a fear of dying. My fear is that I might not live out the fullness of my life in the way God intended it. That's why I choose obedience as a lifetime. God's timing is perfect. So God is telling 
his people a principle, teaching us a principle. When prayer is delayed or denied, we got to ask ourselves a question. Is there something in my life that is a hindrance to the flow of God's blessing? Offense is a hindrance to the free flow of God's blessing in you. And we come from a culture where we are easily offended. Right? Offense between husband and wife, one Peter says, becomes an impediment and a barrier to the blessing of God. Or some lady might say, you know, Pastor, but you don't understand my husband. You don't live with him. And I said, thank God. I to throw that in. One Peter, our prayers are hindered. God has established a structure of authority in the context of the home. And in the natural, Genesis 3 tells me, there will be a strong desire to violate that structure. But when we do, we open our lives to spiritual deception. Ask him about that. And all the men said, one said, is there something that is blocking the flow of God's favor. And if there is, remove it. It's so easy to draw encouragement from people like Hananiah who try to interpret God's will and plan for your life and tell you the things you like to hear, not what we need to hear. That's the difference between true men of God and false ones. The people, when we speak to people like that and God doesn't show up the way they expect, they walk away from the faith. And I've seen over 40 years a lot of people who have walked away from the faith because so-called mature Christians have stumbled them in this area. So be very careful. Never ever try to interpret the will of God for somebody else's life. Because when you do that, you're standing in for God and that's a dangerous place the next thing we learn is that God's timing is perfect. Mine isn't. The law of timing was supreme in the life of Jesus. God is less concerned about our discomfort, more concerned about his timing. 70 years. God wanted to turn things in our lives. But sometimes we have premeditated how that turn is going to happen and we are not open to the new direction it's time to set. They were wanting to go back to Jerusalem because they assumed that the blessing was there. You know, I used to always think the, the grass is green on the other side of the hill. It isn't. It's green where you water it. Some people leave this church and go somewhere else and then I meet them four years later and they say, Wow, you know, we really appreciate your leadership. And I say, isn't that why you left? <laughs> or you may be stuck in a marriage that you wish you could walk out of. And God says, stick it out. Stick it out. He's not saying it's easy. 
But if you're always looking over your shoulder for something better, you'll never appreciate what you have. Amen. Nobody said marriage is going to be easy. If we knew it's going to be so challenging, many of us would have stayed celibate. No. It's a whatever alternative, but it's too late now. But marriage is, is a commitment for life. The sanctity of marriage is what is being challenged today. We, we, just, we, we just got a new set of regulations from the government about the LGBT thing and all. I, if I ever marry on this, anyone on this platform, I will stand up for what I believe, even if I have to go to jail for it. I am not going to kowtow for political familiarity. The word of God is unchangeable. Marriage is between a man and a woman, says the Lord. Quote me on that. Marriage is an institution that is under threat. Yours and mine. But when we understand the sanctity of marriage, that God saw marriage as so holy and sanctified that he personally came to give away the bride. Lord, couldn't you do better than that? I'm sure Adam would have thought of that. God is a finisher. And Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says, I am confident of this one thing. One thing, that he who has begun a good turn in your life will bring it to completion. So God begins the turning process through the prophet Jeremiah. And he says seven years. But the blessing is where you are, not where you want to be. That's important. The blessing is not in changing jobs. Don't be a lousy worker. Improve your work ethic and God will bless you well. The blessing is not in another partnership. The blessing is sticking it out in what you have committed to before God. Trusting that in God's time He will bring what He has promised to us. I am in this for the long haul. That's what God is saying to people. 70 years. It's not going to be easy. But Babylon becomes easier to live in when you look at your life and struggle from God's perspective, not yours. That's it. That's it. Listen, we all expect things to be better. We all want a better life. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you look at what you don't have, you lose sight of what you have. I live, I can tell you, a very contented life. I don't have much, but I have everything in Christ. I live a fulfilled life. I don't envy what somebody else says and I want some other ministry. No, no, no. Because if I look there, I can't appreciate what I have. I'm stuck with you and you're stuck with me, so let's leave it out. No, no, no. Nobody said these things are going to be easy. But God is speaking to some of us this morning. Stop looking back 
Stop looking at what you don't have. Because when you do that, you will never appreciate what is before you. Thank God for the marriage you have. Thank God for the wife you have. Can't forget that one. Thank God for the husband you have. He is a work in progress, she is a work in progress, but I am going to stay committed to this thing. Because God's purpose for my life is established through commitment. Discomfort they were experiencing was only temporary. And God says seven years. When seven years is completed, when my cycle of movement and momentum is complete, you will go back. But some of them will stay there. And they will die there. And that's all right. The Lord told them, build houses, plant vineyards, and be successful. You know, people who are discontented come from dysfunctional homes. They were bad people, but they're just dysfunctional. Because their early life's experiences of negativity have shaped their thinking. And they can never be content. Because the more they have, the more they want. And I see other people, they're happy with little. Some of us have little because we don't know to steward well what we have. That's another sermon in itself. God had a plan. God was at work in Babylon. Even though they thought he was not. So God is telling them, For I know, verse 11, the thoughts that I have towards you are thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. And I heard this preach, this, 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 this one line in, in a text preach without a text. Don't worry, be happy, else is gonna be alright. God says, no, it's not gonna work out the way you want it to. But if you are willing to live a life of surrender, that's the safest place to be on the planet. Two days after I came out of Nao, flights were cancelled. Wow. That's not a happy place to be. Until you get on the plane, your stress levels go up to this. Because God has a time. He makes all things beautiful in His time. God has a plan when they thought he has no plan. So God is speaking into Jeremiah's context to bring fresh perspective. And what we all need to progress is perspective. To view our situation as God says. God says I have a future. When they thought there was no future. Jeremiah was instructed to give his people hope when they were losing him. You know, we have to live out this word. Verse 20, 13, 14 are the key verses to unlocking the plan of God for your life. These are the key verses. For I know the thoughts I have for you to give you an expected end. Then you shall call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you and you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart and I will be found of you, says the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity and gather you from all the nations where I have to So there are some simple principles. Number one, obedience. Number two, surrender. And when I talk about surrender, I don't mean coming up down here and shedding a few tears and going home and then just living the life you, you lived before. That. 
No, no, no. Surrender is something you do daily. It's a daily life choice. When our surrender to God is finally absolute, then we can leave our destiny and future in His hands. But there is something about us as a consequence of the fall of Adam and Eve that causes us to want to manipulate the will of God outside His name. If we truly trust Him, we will surrender and let Him work within His time frame on us. Somebody always quoted this to me long ago, he who sees God's hand in everything, best in everything in God's hands. But this is the problem. We want to tamper with the plan of God. We want to stand in for God. We want to interpret the plan of God for somebody else's life when we can't discover God's plan for our lives. Jesus said the blind cannot lead the blind, they'll both fall into a ditch. The fact that some people are 30 years, 40 years in the faith doesn't necessarily mean they have more insight into God's will for your life than you who are two years in the faith. In fact, I personally believe that some new Christians have more insight into the reality of God's direction than some of us who have been there a long time because we have heard God so long and so often we no longer take Him seriously. <coughs> Paul says, I watch my life, guard my life carefully, lest having preached to others, I become a castaway, a rejected sample. Sometimes we got to be careful that we hear God's voice so often that after a while we become desensitized to the Holy Spirit. And some people just read their Bible in the morning on a habit, say their prayer, after the heart in heaven, glory be, amen. And they're on their way till next morning. In the Bible, 14,000 odd times God speaks. And if you and I are just willing to shut out all the other negative voices, all the other confusing voices, and learn to be sensitive to the voice of God, He will speak. He said, God wants to speak. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. You know, I'm a I, I've seen meetings when prophets come to town and there are long lines of people who are too lazy to read the Bible for themselves. And say, oh, they stand back, give me a word. Read the word. Jesus is the word. In the New Testament, the office of the prophet has been downsized. First the apostle, then the prophet. And we just want these external expressions because we are too lazy to read our Bibles. Or like you said, we listen to a podcast and there's nothing wrong with that. But God wants to speak to you from time to time directly and direct the course of your life if you are open and willing to listen. Jeremiah had to speak a word that was uncomfortable. But he did. And even in the midst of that captivity, we see an expression of God's grace. I'm reminded of Jeremiah 31 verse 2, if I remember correctly. The people found grace in the wilderness. Even when they were disobedient outside the will of God, God's grace was extended. The only reason some of us continue to live the way we do is because of the grace of God even though we are walking personally in disobedience. God doesn't 
endorse this obedience. He told Saul, Saul, why were you disobedient? Saul is bringing a sacrifice and God is specific. God is specific. He said, if, if you were just obedient, your kingdom would never have been parted from you. You would have had an everlasting kingdom. Wow! But then he missed. Saul lived a less than life. And the Bible would have been rewritten. Because out of Saul's line would the Messiah come. And yet, one simple act of disobedience had a consequence. For one reason, when we are in leadership, God holds us to a higher standard. That's the reason. That's the reason. And I feel sorry for Saul. Saul was a weak leader. He gave the people what they needed, wanted, not what God wanted. And that's the consequence. And he says the spirit of God eventually is. I wouldn't, I for me personally, I wouldn't want to live a less than life. We all struggle. We all are human. And yet, when God speaks with clarity and intent, we got to make the course adjustments that are necessary. Because the blessing and favor of God can only come in its fullness of us when we choose obedience as a lifestyle. Sure.